That's a uh, great case. Can't promise that mine are all going to look that good at the end. Um, so I was asked to give a discussion about what happens when you're doing osteotomies and things go wrong. So this is a little bit less of a technical uh, case and more of a discussion as to what the response is. This is a six-year-old child with prader willi syndrome who was initially sent to us from an outside provider because of worsening bow-leggedness as well as uh, scoliosis which it was remarkable that they were actually able to pick it up. Um, this, is, this child has prader willi morbid obesity with sleep apnea, and nightly CPAP. Um, these are old x-rays from when he was two. He's now six. He has a BMI of 52, is three foot nine, weighs 151 pounds with uh, junivarum, and uh, ambulates with a waddling gait. Um, so this was his uh, clinical appearance. These are the radiographs. And so I, I'm not, in the sake of time, I'm not going to ask for a lot of polls, but does anybody have thoughts on, for a progressive deformity like this, what their instrumentation of choice might be? Maybe I'll ask the panel. Matt, do you have any thoughts? How old? Eight? Six. 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 I'm not sure. I okay. mean, I think that it's going to be difficult to hold anything there, but I think sort of traditional type of growing rod would put up be. I'm not sure the magnetic rod would have the oomph to yeah, and, and we like were. They like to get junctional, so do not uh, leave plenty of kyphosis. Right, and he had, it's hard to make out. This was on an old x ray machine, but I can promise you it doesn't get that much better with a BMI of 52. Um, so, uh, so I was really sort of disinclined to pursue anything that would re require either a magnet reaching through 10 or 12 centimeters of uh, adipose tissue, and I wasn't particularly interested about surgically reaching through that. So we were, our plan was to move forward with uh, growth guidance using a Schiller technique. Um, and given the fact that he was a pretty high anesthetic risk and we had a, con a preoperative conference, we decided to also stage with a, pre with a uh, um, guided growth at the same time, which is probably bad juju uh, to, to do that at the same time, but we, uh, we decided to move forward to this. This was a very small portion of the case. From a surgical standpoint, on the kyphoscoliotic uh, correction, we uh, transferred the patient to a table, which is challenging, and positioning was a little bit challenging as well. Um, and one of the things that I think was learned in this procedure was the sensitivity of the patient to, uh, and, their mo and their neuromonitoring to propofol. So we typically run a TIVA at our institution, but when you're going on a mix per kg basis and they weigh this much, they are incredibly sensitive. So running at sort of your traditional dose of 50 or 75 per ends up being an inordinate amount of propofol. So we struggle with that a little bit, um, but we're able to get uh, motors. We did our typical Schiller approach and did, uh, and were able to get our Schiller screws in at the uh, midline after we had Pontes. Um, but about five minutes after our Pontes were done, we lost our motors. Um, again, they'd been, the motors had been somewhat irregular during the entire procedure. Uh, but we'd gotten to a point where they were pretty consistent. And at this point, we took out our instrumentation, went through the Vitaly checklist, um, and with no changes in neuromonitoring, although continued strong SACPs, uh, we decided to abort, took out our hardware, and took the patient to the MRI. Um, the MRI was pretty uh, uh, benign in appearance that we saw the scoliosis that we knew, but no real cord changes and no uh, aberrant tracks. And he woke up weak uh, with about two to three out of five in his lower extremities, although it was a little bit difficult based on his, uh, his cognitive delay, um, but did endure sensation. And so we took him to the unit and uh, maintained our MAP goals, which were high other than two outliers. Uh, but the next morning, unfortunately, when we uh, came in, he did not have any active motor in his lower extremity, and so he was taken for an emergent myelogram. Uh, knowing that the MRI had been normal the day before. And so the myelogram was done with the idea that we may have um, an acute cutoff of, uh, of contrast. And when, in fact, we did find that. You can see the difference between T10 here and T9 here. Um, there's a little bit of a technical issue here in a really obese patient because they need it to be rolled side to side, and that's sort of hard. But we felt that this was adequate uh, indication for us to bring him back. Um, he was taken back emergently for a uh, laminectomy and pediculectomy, and Dave Skaggs actually taught me this technique a few years back. Um, and we did not have motor signals, but did a wide decompression of both pedicles and did an apical fusion just spanning that segment. Um, you can see here uh, on sort of su subsequent post-operative day one, he had what we thought was a very slight um, meaningful response to painful stimuli, but that was about it. And this was the uh, radiograph that we had at that time with the bridging instrumentation. 
fortunately, uh, about four months later, this was him, um, moving his legs pretty well, and we saw a slow but steady return, minimal gain in height over time, uh, but as would ex be expected over the first year, you can see progressive kyphosis that worsened a lot over the second year. Um, and so now we're at 20 months post-op, he's now eight, and does anybody vote for going back in with a growing spine construct here? No, right. So we, uh, we did what, was, what we felt would be uh, best at this point. Two attendings, pure TIVA, which we ran mostly at under 25 mg per kg, uh, because at this point he weighs 82 kilos. Um, it was a one and a half hour instrumentation and a six hour plastic surgery closure um, with normal signals at the end of the case and at wake up, and he's now walking again with a walker, um, and uh, he's happy and one of my favorite patients, so. Yes, Rick. So we found almost complete fusion. Um, yes. Oh, when, when we did the resection, no epidural hematoma, um, no, I mean, really no nothing. It, it didn't, it, it was a little bit difficult, and I'm wondering that with time during the case, with general relaxation that's going to occur from the anesthetic, whether or not his kyphosis ended up kinking him off a little bit, but it really wasn't impressive. We felt enough of the uh, cord was tensed around those two pedicles that a pediculectomy was indicated, but it really wasn't that impressive. Uh, so he was, uh, it, it was interesting, it, after his first operation, we placed him into a brace to try to, and I left this part out for the sake of time, but we placed him in a, into a brace to try to uh, sort of provide some stability, but he was so big that he got a pretty large pressure sore right over the distal aspect of his incision. So when they went back, they thought, oh, well, he's a big, we'll be able to just pull it together, but it was uh, scored up pretty badly, so they had to do a, a, a significant closure, rotate a flap. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so we were uh, performing a wake-up test, but he was, again, because of the propofol dose in a child at this weight, it was going to take several hours. So at this point, we opted to get him off the table and get an MRI. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Interesting case.